Campaign Foundation um, as Director of Special Projects in Adult Education. And I'm standing next to one of my oldest friends, Melanie Bear Keeley, one of my youngest friends, <laughs> who actually was the co-manager here at Theodore Payne from 1986 to 1992. 25 years ago. And she is just loving all of the changes and growth that we have had at this place that she struggled so hard to keep going when, when it wasn't so popular or so hip. Put in natives. <laughs> yeah, we, we aspired to hipness. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, when I came 25 years ago, I was the only employee, and when I left about six or seven years later, there were about 13 employees. So we, you know, now we have 19. Yeah, and Melanie was amazed when I started here 10 years ago and told her that I had health insurance. And she went, oh my God. <laughs> so we've really come a long way. And it's, it's in no small part to all of you guys that support us and buy plants and take classes and tell your neighbors and friends about us. And that's really great. So um, what we decided to do, because we both have kind of the same bent in horticulture, was to uh, do a little dog and pony show for you. Yeah. So Melanie had a program that she had prepared, and then I had a program, and she was kind enough to spend a lot of time combining our stuff together. And so we hope it will be cogent. And, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you have to only really quickly tell you the handouts, because you don't have to look at them all now. But um, the staple packet says getting started. Um, is uh, just a few of the two dozen things we have here called plant guides. They're basically just cheat sheets for you and instructions. So one is our getting started handout, one is our planting guide, how to properly plant a native plant, because you don't use soil amendments, and so it's how to do that. Um, and then getting your plants established, which if we have a little time at the end, I'm going to spend five minutes doing, because a lot of people think they can just plant the plant in water at once and walk away. You can do that, but you're going to lose a lot more plants if you do that. <laughs> so we want you to know how to take care of these little guys that you take home from the nursery. And then two that I added in just for fun are aromatic native plants handout, which uh, features fragrant foliage and fragrant flowers. And then one of my favorites, which is Missing the Back, I just realized. So you might want to pick up another copy of this in the shop. Um, the native plants are butterflies and moths. The front is how to make a garden for those guys. The back should have a chart of plants that are food for the, lar for the larvae and food for the adults. So somehow just in our copy this morning, that didn't happen. So um, feel free to pick up. You can get these at the sales booth in the nursery. There's a little bank of them on the front of the sales booth. Or you can get them in the shop, or you can download them from our website. And we're constantly making new ones and updating them. So these are some TDF handouts. And then Melanie brought in the coolest thing. Where's my stack? Well, Melanie brought in the coolest thing, which was something she developed when she was here um, that we're going to redo and uh, put our logo on it and stuff. But it's, it's <laughs> and fix the spellings because a lot of the names are old on this. So um, it is general information on landscaping with California plants for fire retardants and erosion control. And it's really great. I mean, I read it, and it's just really wonderful uh, information. And then a pretty copious list of fire-resistant plants. And Melanie will describe what fire-resistant means. Um, and then uh, last but not least is a uh, resource list of recommended reading and other places to find more information. So those are your handouts from us today. And then I'm going to set this out on the uh, registration table. This goldenrod sheet is upcoming classes at the European. Um, which includes the rest of the Latuna uh, Canyon Regeneration Series and other things that we're having before the end of the year. And that's all. Okay, and I just wanted to say a word about the handout, General Information on Landscaping with Native Plants for Fire Returns. Keep in mind any plant will burn and that these plants were selected from a vast array of different lists of, of plants that are supposed to be, uh, you know, I'd say resistive to burning for various reasons, mostly because of their, their profile, their stature, uh, and maybe succulents uh, or halophytic uh, nature. So just keep in mind, my disclaimer is, is any plant will burn under certain conditions. This is just kind of a starting point. All right? All right. So. And we too are suckers for questions if you have any. Uh, yeah, I prefer interaction. You know, if we are clear on something, uh, please let us know. 
Uh, and I, I am also such an advocate of California Native Plants, president of the my local CNPS chapter, California Native Plant Society chapter, and I always feel like I need to talk to people about the state of California Native Plants. You know, they are a uh, precious resource, um, and a lot of people aren't appreciative of the fact that California is one of uh, the world's global hotspots, one of 35. Oops, sorry, sorry, heading, where is that? <laughs> Um, and that uh, over the whole nation, there are about 18,000 species, and within California, we have a third of those, which is over six, around six to seven thousand. And of those six to seven thousand, uh, a third of them occur nowhere else on the planet. So that, by nature, makes them, you know, precious and and threatened. California Native Plant Society has identified a third of those 6,000 plants as being species of concern, being threatened with extinction for various reasons. You know, it can be population-related pressures, it can be, you know, too frequent fires, whatever the case. And then by law, 405 of those are state and federally listed to be threatened, or threatened or endangered. Um, so keep that in mind, you know, every time you plant a native plant, you know, you're doing something to, to help uh, with that condition. Now, um, most of us here in California live in a Mediterranean climate. We're looking at the California floristic province, which occurs on the east, I mean on the west, sorry, on the west side of the Sierra Nevada mountains and up into Oregon. And this Mediterranean climate uh, as you know, features moist winters and warm uh, arid summers. And they are subject to droughts, fire, and flood, as many of you already know, especially if you've had interaction over this last summer with the Latuna Canyon fire. I mean, would you like to say a word? <laughs> so there are five Mediterranean climate zones on the planet. You can see California there. Um, uh, one part of central Chile facing the Pacific Ocean, the Cape Floristic Province at the bottom of the African continent, which happens to be the richest floral area on the planet, um, and oddly, the uh, city flower of Los Angeles is from the Cape Floristic Province, <laughs> the, bird, <laughs> the bird of paradise, so um, we might want to change that someday. Um, also in Australia, parts of uh, western and southwest Australia, and around the Mediterranean Sea, thus the name Mediterranean Basin. What these all have in common um, in many ways, they all have cool wet winters, so we get all of our rain dropped on us in a three to four month period during the cool season. Um, they all are next to fairly cool bodies of water and mostly facing west, which affects the rain patterns and many other things. Um, they also um, are equidistant from the equator, which is not shown on this graph, but I think that's really interesting. Um, what is also very interesting about them is that they all have a very long history of geological um, uh, uh, histories and formations which have made them really interesting parts of the world with great variations in geography, with volcanoes and mountains and deserts and all these you know, changes in elevation that are very significant. And they all have a really diverse flora because of this. Um, California has the hugest of all of them, but they all have amazing flora. And they're also all really nice places, the places that my grandparents and parents came out to because this was a great place to live. So all five of these places are biodiversity hotspots because they are threatened by human development and population. So they're great, uh, I think if I remember correctly, they make up less, uh, about 2% of the world's geographical area, terrestrial, and, but more than 20% of our plants come from these areas. So they're really full of biology. And with all these plants, of course, goes animals too, because they all evolve together and they depend on each other. So you can borrow plants from these other Mediterranean climates to combine with your natives, but we hope that you will learn today what's more, what's, what's special about using the natives. Um, and the first thing is that they don't support the animals as well, um, the non-natives, because they didn't evolve with these plants. So you put in natives and you're not only making a beautiful garden that might hold your slopes and be more fire safe, etc., etc., but also you're putting in a little zoo and you're going to end up seeing so many animals you would not see with a non-native garden. So 
being that we're subject to fire and floods, as John so aptly pointed out, um, our floor has definitely evolved with fire, and uh, it is a beautiful flora. This picture was taken at Duke Meiji in the Wilderness Park, um, and it was post the station fire, which you might remember from a few years ago. And the diversity that you see right after fire that you can, if there's a silver lining after the Latuna Canyon fire, you can look forward to seeing some of these not often seen plants. So the way we've set up today's talk is we, we hope to cover each one of these subjects um, one at a time. Why use native plants at all? I always feel a little defensive, like I need to <laughs> convince people that you should use native plants and those especially that are local to your region. Um, and how to have a fire safe home, how to design a, a landscape with native plants uh, for fire safety, for you know the, the greatest fire safety. Uh, how to place your plants, how to create defensible space how to water prior to a fire or during a fire actually, and then maintenance, pruning and care of native plant, of native plant gardens to keep it fire safe. Um, how to, uh, well not how to, but the need for removing invasive plants as a part of your maintenance uh, and slope protection. And then in the next session, Lily and I are occupying two time uh, uh, windows basically and so in the second half we'll be talking about possible plants you can select from. So why use California native plants? Again I always feel like people just especially in view of the fact that we have a climate a Mediterranean climate in which there is there are fire dependent uh, there is fire dependent vegetation you know a lot of people think I want to yank out all the native plants, you know, I don't want them to risk burning, but there are so many things to recommend having California native plants in your garden. Um, as you can see, they are adapted to this climate. I see this is psychologically adapted. Psychologically <laughs> adapted, yes. They are physically, uh, psychologically and physiologically adapted to our climate. Uh, they, as John illustrated, they come back up, they require fire in some instances to uh, germinate post-fire. They are able to tolerate uh, long, long periods of time without water. You know, in our area, John and I live up in central Sierra Nevada, basically, and it's seven months without water. How do these plants survive, you know? It's, it's really, it always amazes me in addition to um, the fact that, I mean, it makes the choice very logical. You need to plant natives to tolerate our climates. Uh, they are very low in maintenance of care. They uh, provide watershed protection. What that means is they keep water in the system uh, and they keep water able to run downhill and actually be utilized by us. Um, they keep water in the system, basically. Uh, create habitat, as Lily said, for wildlife, and there are many instances where the pollinator fits exactly with one species, and if the plant is lost, then so is the pollinator. Um, and a lot of animals, obviously, are dependent on the native vegetation, particularly. Uh, they have functionality, erosion control, shading, cooling, you name it. Um, barriers, <laughs> the, the plants serve a function. Uh, in some cases, some of the plants that are available and can be used actually are endangered in their native habitat, and by planting them in your garden, you are perpetuating that genetic uh, material and protecting that particular species. And they, uh, by planting natives, you can preserve genetic diversity and why is that important you know because each plant basically has a genetic thumbprint that can possibly be used to you know like in the case of one native plant uh, in the Pacific Northwest Pacific View it's used to cure breast cancer and 
each plant has a unique thumbprint that can be possibly used um, as our in the pharmacy and most of the pharmaceuticals we have are based on actually the genetic makeup of certain plants. From an aesthetic point of view, you know, I, one pet peeve that I have not only is it that our Los Angeles state flower is a plant from South Africa, the bird of paradise, but the fact that, you know, there is a harmony. You know, if uh, in our area particularly, we, which is Central California, again, up against the Sierra Nevada, people move in from the Bay Area in Los Angeles and they mow down all of the native vegetation, totally changing the whole ambiance. In our area, we live in a beautiful chaparral dominated area and for them to take down the sycamores and take out the cyanothus and chemise uh, and plant things that won't work is just I me mean, no shortage so of I'm going to annotate so it's about sense of place yes which is a, a, a phrase that's been so used but I think it really still works and my feeling is you move to Topanga, you move to Three Rivers because it's beautiful and then you change and put in a movie via. You know, it's yeah. something a little wrong. For those of us that know plants, it's really deser mm -hmm. disturbing and unnerving. So, um, we can move on. Oh, I have more. Oh, you too. I'm so, sorry. it's okay because I had little notes. Um, so, uh, it's about sustainability, and I think Melanie touched on that in the first slide, that nothing is going to be more sustainable than these plants in picking Southern California plants or Southern California. Um, nothing's going to be more drought or heat tolerant than these plants, if you pick the right ones. Um, and then the punchlines, they smell really good. Okay, it's about aesthetics, and they're really pretty. Nobody wants an ugly garden, which is a line that I borrowed from Owen Dell. You know, nobody wants an ugly garden, so you're going to be putting in something that's beautiful. And I'll put a little uh, shout out for our garden tour, which shows you wonderful examples of native plant gardens. Um, one of the criteria is that they have to be at least 50% native plants. Um, and every garden is as unique as its owner. The next garden tour is April 14th and 15th of next year, Saturday and Sunday, April 14th and 15th. And we just saw the list, there'll be 47 gardens oh on it. So it's, if you haven't been, it's divided up between two days by region, and you plot your own itinerary based on the characteristics of gardens, and then go see these wonderful spots. Most people see maybe five to eight in a day. Um, and we cluster them together so you don't spend all your time in the car. But uh, you're going to mark your calendars for April 14th and 15th, 2018. We did the first garden tour about 12 gardens 25 years ago, yep. so it's really beautiful. Yep. Yep. You. You. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so it's my slide. Um, uh, this image was actually borrowed from uh, well, it's, it's East East Bay Mud, but actually um, this is from something that's on your resource list, um, which is the University of California Cooperative Extension has a really nice site for fire issues, and um, this is one of the graphics that was up there. Um, the idea is that fire safety at your house starts with your house, and this was one of the big issues in Santa Rosa was none of those houses were outfitted for fire, even though historically that had been in a fire area. And so they, they didn't have roofs that wouldn't burn, they had open eaves, all of the bad, bad things. So um, the, on the left is the non-fire, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's a sensitive baby. Um, so on the left side is the, the not fire safe home with a flammable roof, with overhanging eaves, with a deck that's open on the bottom, I mean, all these ways for fire to travel and catch. Um, and make things worse. So on the right side, it's kind of a boring looking house, but the idea is there um, that you've got um, a stucco, or you've got tile roof or something that's composition or slate that doesn't burn, um, short overhangs that any vents on the outside are closed up so no members can get in there into the vents and into your attic to smolder and burn, um, to enclose the bottom of the deck. I mean, these seem like really common sense things, uh, but it all starts with making your home fire safe, and that's the point of this. And then, um, I kind of like, I found this picture, and I just think it's a beautiful garden, and it shows an example of, this gives firemen, fire people, firefighters, the opportunity to work, that they have space where they can put their equipment and come down and try to protect your home. If this was all massively planted with closely um, spaced plants, it would be really hard for them to get in here and do anything. Um, so just an example of creating a beautiful space, and it doesn't all have to be planted. And a field break. 
and a fuel break, exactly. And that's a significant width for it, so it really can't have an effect. <laughs> so yeah. this is, we're both like, ah! So one of the things I learned in John's longer talk um, was a um, study being done on defensible space, because this is one of the things that's required around homes and uh, fire prone areas. So um, John might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but they were studying the difference between 100 foot, 200 foot, and 300 feet of defensible space around a home. Um, in the state of California, it's required to be 100 feet. In Los Angeles County, it's required to be 200 feet. And so, of course, you have to go with your fire rules. Uh, what John was showing in this picture is that when you start getting into 300 feet, not only are you building a moonscape and not a very nice place to live, but um, when you clear the area that widely, um, you are giving the opportunity for the non-native invasive weeds, especially the grasses, to come in, so you're creating a fire hazard. So it's, it's you know, you're tipping the balance the other way by being too generous with your defensible space. So if I remember correctly, John's research is showing that 100 feet has shown to be most sufficient. But in LA County, you have to do 200 feet um, if they tell you to. Um, what else you want to say about this? Oh, not only that, but it creates erosion issues right. that have to be contended with having a lack of deep-rooted plants. The other thing that you might point out is if everybody were to do what those people did, create a 300-foot clearance, it impacts the amount of open space substantially in uh, the, the region. We estimated that in San Diego County, if everybody did 300-foot clearances, by 2050, we'd probably lose about 40% of our open space. And, you, and what you're doing, what you're losing here is not only the plants, but the habitat for the animals. So it's really changing the whole ecosystem there. On the bright side, it looks like there's fire safe homes down there. <laughs> they look just as ugly as that they were on the other <laughs> slide. <laughs> Um, so this was a gift from Jay Lopez. Kitty had a meeting and, and he was saying the ideal garden outside, and Jay Lopez will be one of my speakers this afternoon, he's with the uh, LA County Fire Department, um, that if you develop a garden, it should be a garden that can be seen from the indoors. So the concept of this was that if you don't, if you can see that garden, and obviously it's not a native garden, um, but if you can see out that well, it means you don't have plants that are hanging down from the eaves, you don't have plants that are closely planted to the house that might be overhanging the roof and block, you know, and be right next, and you've got fuel right next to your house. So the idea is to, uh, anything will show you more of this, but you know, really low stuff near the house, and as you move out, that's where you have your larger plants. Um, and it really is, this is where you want to see it. You don't want to be blocked in anyway and be depressed and dark. So um, if you can see the garden and, and the shapes of it, and you're also going to be having that, that space away from the house, which is another uh, place where they can be working, which is important. Okay, so uh, <laughs> once in always my editor, thank you so much. <laughs> Late last night, we were working on this, and I think we were both a little blinded by the exhaustion. So, a couple of uh, just policies and practices that we recommend when you're placing plants. Design is everything. If you have a new garden that you're planning, you know, as Lily said, you want nothing. Oopsie, gosh, darn it. Uh, you want nothing that are. Uh, come up under the eaves right up against the house. You don't want plants overhanging your roof line. Uh, vertical and horizontal separation is really important. That means you don't want to create ladders, fuel ladders going into the upper canopies. And that also goes for from tree to tree. You want to keep the canopies separated so that if fire catches one, it won't feed right into the other. Uh, it's good to plant in islands, you know, groups of plants that have spaces in between, 15 foot is what Cal Fire recommends. Um, again, space tree and shrub canopies about 15 feet apart, generally speaking, and do not plant in invasive horticultural species, and there are quite a few of them, you know, that we are all continuing. So I'm, I'm going to get uh, a little prop here. So this is the terrible ten poster. 
Um, and we have a gift for you today if you like it. Uh, we had run out of these posters and Marissa brought some in today, so have a little roll if you'd like to take one. Um, it's a collector's item at this point. Um, this is the 10 worst invasive non-native horticultural plants, invasive pests in Southern California. So, and you will recognize a lot of them from uh, fountain grass, which is on all of our hills everywhere, um, castor bean, tree of heaven, which was brought here in the 1840s by the Chinese that were working on the railroads, etc. But these are things many of them can still find in nurseries. So this is a place that you can really make a difference as a gardener, is not to purchase these things. And you can be even more of a squeaky wheel in your nursery and say, why are you selling them for major and telling people to put this out in the wild? Or in, in gardens, it's a problem. So these are things to avoid. Um, the terrible 10. Um, we also have some cards inside the shop that are weed watch cards, you know, good, good weed, bad weed. And you can take one of those with you. I think all we have is the Spanish version left, but the plant names are the same. Is pampas grass on there? Yeah, pampas grass is on here. Do you know that Theodore Payne actually introduced yes, that? Yes, <laughs> I mean, and that just goes to show that you really, if you see plants that are really succeeding and getting aggressive in your yard, you have to think twice about it, introducing it further as horticulturists. So. You do. Uh, this is your slide. Oh, I so, do. Well, okay. So this is uh, this graphic is a Cal Fire graphic, and this is what you will be confronting if you live in the foothill, chaparral urban interface. And um, we will look at this specifically. As Lily said, it's really important to have you know kind of open. I'm not saying plant turf. This is not what I'm indicating here, but open, create open spaces for the staging of the fire personnel so that they can take a stand and defend your home. Very important. Uh, using the same graphic, um, what they suggest in this first 30-foot uh, area, 30-foot from a structure, you need to select non-flammable plants, and again, by that, I mean, every plant's going to burn, but pick low-growing ground cover types, keep them thinned of any dead material, and remove any dead wood that is on, you know, especially within this 30-foot um, uh, circumference from your house. And uh, this area has to be highly maintained to keep it safe, low mow any dried grasses or weeds, Again, thin, and as we talked about spacing plants, it's super important to keep the spacing that I mentioned, 15-foot canopies and islands, um, and have no trees overhanging the structure, uh, and uh, especially the chimneys. Keep your gutters cleared of dead material, really important. Um, hardscape can be used in this area as long as they aren't open decks where embers can go underneath. Uh, you know, like Lily illustrated in that first graphic. Uh, hardscapes, patios, that kind of thing, pools, uh, will help give a fire break and protect your home. Um, and terracing slows the advent of fire. In the sec, oops, the, sorry, what happened here? Okay, so this is an example of extending the hardscape. I mean, this is a typical residential garden, but it is one way to, you know, to open up the land and break up the planting areas to reduce the chance of fire spread. So in the second zone here, uh, here to here, and filtering into native uh, habitat, perhaps. You know, a lot of us live in the foothills and. Uh, but um, uh, like BLM land or federal lands. And you, you do need to, uh, of course, keep the dry, burnable wood uh, at a minimum. Try to take it out. Keep your grasses, dry grasses, low, uh, low mode. Um, and thin and carefully space the plants. Not quite as intensively as in this first 30-foot zone, but nevertheless, you, you need to to do that. This picture is a laurel sumac, which infamously burns very hot, but all the twiggy growth has been taken out and it has uh, to one of, about one third of its overall height. 
um, and so that would be considered fire safe. As we mentioned before, and just stop me if you want to say something, add something. Uh, you know, this is illustrative of some problems with clearance. You can see this huge landslide, and once again, I just want to reiterate that it's fire and flood. The spring following a fire can wreak havoc on the hillside, and there's nothing to break up the water drops and precipitation, and so you still need to keep retain some plantings to keep this from happening. And California native shrub roots can be 20 feet deep easily. It's how they survive. It's how they kept California from sliding off into the ocean, I've been told. <laughs> Um, I'm or, on, or onto the PCH. Yes, right. <laughs> right. So, um, and prior to a fire, it's really important to keep plants within that 30-foot zone, that first zone, plumped up and, and hydrated, um, and they will be less likely to burn. Anticipate if it's going to be hot, if they're going to be Santa Ana's drying those plants out, water in advance plump up those, that vegetation. And as you radiate outward from your home in those zones, you know, plant more and more natives. Hopefully you'll be filtering into a native environment. You may not, you may be right next to your, your neighbor, but uh, try to have less and less water usage as you get into the wild landscape. You know, this is our situation, it may not be yours, but um, you want to have high, intensely managed plants up against the house and getting sequentially less as you get into the wild landscape, because you want to protect that wild landscape too. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so um, at Theodore Payne every year, we have a crew that comes in for two weeks or more and does uh, brush, brush clearance on our 22 acres. And if you're in a fire area, I'm sure the fire department visits you and requires that as well. So what's very important, it's really about volume, not necessarily the choice of plants you use. Um, but we want to reduce surface fuel. So on a, um, you're going to keep your dried weeds and grasses very close to the ground um, and away from roadsides, away from shrubby vegetation that could catch on fire because of uh, the fuel of the burning weeds. Um, and within 30 feet from any structures, for sure. So these are things you want to keep the area open and nothing dry, no tinder, basically, that um, can fuel the fire. Um, we recommend that you do use mulches around your plants. Um, they have many, many horticultural reasons for being there. Um, we recommend uh, uh, three to four inches in most situations. And if it's organic mulch, it's going to decompose and you need to bring in a new load every year. Um, this is a, a bone of contention that you may have with your firefighters that come in, the inspectors, because mulch they see as burning fuel, but we want you to use it for horticultural reasons, so there's a little conflict there. Um, but keep it at four to five inches. You know, mulch is not dried leaves and stuff, it's, it's larger particles that don't catch quite as easily. Um, and also to re remove excess leaves that are around the base of shrubs, so anything that's really dry but mulch is very important. Um, Keep your dead leaves out of house gutters, and also um, to clean the roof. Uh, if you know, if, even if you don't have a tree overhanging your roof, um, I know there's a pine tree not overhanging my roof, but my garage roof has constantly got pine needles on it from the wind. So this is a place where you want to clean off um, dead vegetation that's also on the roof and out of the house gutters for sure. Um, in terms of uh, pictures you saw before about trees being limbed up from the bottom so they basically look like lollipops. Um, the idea here is that the mid-sized shrubs, if they have branches that go all the way to the ground, it just becomes a ladder for the fire. So if you take off the lower branches and thin out anything that's dead and twiggy, you're going to make those plants less likely to be, uh, become torches and burn. Um, so limb them up and um, keep them, the, oh, the uh, plants clear in the middle of dead areas. Um, and we, uh, when you reduce the live foliage, we don't want you to do it too much on a regular basis because the plants actually need their live foliage. Um, but opening up the canopy can help to keep it from being uh, more of a torch. And here's a good example of a beautiful manzanita with a nice open canopy, but underneath it is a nasty non-native weed. Um, and this is just an accident, a, a disaster waiting to happen is what's happening in this picture. And there is Kitty's favorite beautiful manzanita. Um, this is a beautiful Dr. Herd that we believe is a rancho, right? 
is that right? Yeah, the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden um, that has been beautifully pruned up to show the, the inner structure of this gorgeous native plant. And that happens to be a good one for down here, Dr. Hurd. Yeah. And we already sort of went over this, but we're looking at this from a perspective of maintenance rather than planting and design. You know, important again to selectively remove plants if they're one next to another and create a path of potential fire, then you want to selectively remove some of them to keep that 15 foot distance. However, and, however yeah. retain, re, you know, cut it off at the ground and then for the, the impending winters and precipitation, you want to retain the roots at least for the first couple of winters um, to stabilize the soil so you don't have it run down the hill. And again, you want to, every year you want to go through and you want to thin the dead wood out of all of your plants. Okay, I want to put, uh, remind you that on December 16th, um, Dr. Sabrina Drill from the University of California Cooperative Extension will be coming to give the last talk in the Latino Regeneration Series. Um, and she's going to be talking about the importance of avoiding and removing invasive species in general. Oh, um, concentrating on plants, but there are also some um, animals that she's going to mention in there. Um, uh, the, the problem being that these things take up the space where a native would be, and John mentioned that, that you know, with repeat um, uh, filling of spaces with these things, the natives don't come back. Uh, they don't have the roots that might um, help us with soil stabilization. Um, they're fire hazards big time, and they don't support the native animals because the native animals didn't evolve with these flowers and these plants. So, um, and they're taking up the space of those natives that would offer those echo services. So one of the things that we have offered to you is as things start coming back um, on your property or uh, in your area, that we can help you identify. It's pretty hard for us to identify those little grasses when you bring them in, but we can probably tell you what the broadleaf plants are if you bring them in, or take a picture if you think it's a native and you don't want to take it out. Um, and we'll do our best here at the European to help you identify what may or may not be um, an invasive plant. And again, feel free to take any of the literature we have here. And on your resource list, there is, uh, under online websites, um, there's an asterisk next to it. It's uh, Cal Ipsy. I don't know if there's, no, there's no asterisk next to it. That's Cal Ipsy, which is the California Invasive Plant Council. And their, um, their wing, which is Plant Right, which is their effort to go into nurseries and get nursery people to stop selling plants that are problems out in the wild. And it's a really good resource for you to look and see what the invasive plants are and um, which ones might be coming up. Um, all of these things, the black mustard isn't in the trade too much, but the fountain grass and castor bean are things that you can still buy and uh, you want to avoid those getting up there. I want to say one more thing, and that is right after the fires, you see these come up, hit them hard the first couple of seasons because they're not easy to get out at this stage. You want to get them when they're seedlings. Yeah, before they, before they um, mature seed and start distributing it is when you want to get out your weeds. Ah. I know, really. So here's a couple of horrible invasions. This is taken in Hawaii, but, you know, it's... This is constantly being sold right now. It's in almost every landscape, and don't let me see you planting yours. It's going to come after you. And right now in our area, we have this growing, this is Spanish broom, in our river, and it is, it is overtaking anything natural. Um, you know, it just dominates in an area, and it sucks out the water and uh, just creates this noxious environment that's very flammable. Of course, so does tamarisk. To the water supper upper. <laughs> so, um, very important, there are things you can do after the fire um, and, uh, on slopes that may have been burned or in danger of eroding. Um, John touched on this also. Um, I'd like to suggest that if you have a significant um, slope that you may want to get some professional advice on how to handle this. The uh, last thing you want is the slope falling into your house are falling down. Um, so if, if you feel the need, go ahead and seek professional advice. And then figure out which physical means that you can use to slow or divert the erosion. Um, so that would include jute netting or straw wattles. Um, we tell you not to plant 
um, and uh, as much as possible. However, and the main reason we're telling people not to plant this year is because it's not going to help you this winter. Um, so, but if you are going to plant, for instance, some low-growing ground covers in the jute netting, you can cut a little hole in that and plant. So it does. But what you plant this fall is going to be helping you next year and in subsequent years in terms of the roots, not this year. Um, I mentioned this before, that if you go to Theodore Payne's YouTube channel, um, you can see the Sustainable Slopes talk by Josh Link. And also, um, you may want to visit after the event today. We're a pretty short lunch, so there won't be time. But when we finish at 2.30, you're welcome to go up to see our fire management demonstration garden, which is inside the nursery gates, and we can direct you over there. Um, it's a work in progress, but it gives you some ideas about um, what you could do in terms of basic um, design for fire management. And we got a little, we have to go pretty quickly here. So, um, what we really, let's go back one. So, what we really <laughs> want to do is, you know, to encourage people to let nature take over. Um, there is a huge bank of seeds that is lying underground that has been waiting for decades to germinate and give you a beautiful, beautiful spring in the Verdugos. So, we just need to be patient. And it is a human thing to want to go and help. But what John forgot to mention, I'm going to let him do, is he talked about the Severide effect. What's the quote? So it was all about the, the mustard being out there. And what's the quote? Most Eric Sever writes, most, most problems are Most high. problems begin with solutions. Most problems begin with <laughs> solutions. Okay? So don't be the solution. You know, let nature solve the problem. Okay, next. Um, and these are some of the things. There's toxic, Toxicoscordion. That's the new name for the, hmm. the star Zygadine. Uh, so that's, John showed you the picture of all those bulbs coming up with those people out in the field. And these are two of uh, the many phacelias that are waiting to bloom in the verdugos. Now, if you want a list of these plants, on your resource list is a very, very long URL. Southern California botanists, um, a team of botanists did a uh, survey of all of the plants in the Verdugo, Mount the Verdugo Mountains and the San Rafael Hills. Um, it was a small print, so you probably can't get the book, but it's available online. So it's on your resources. You can see the whole history. You can see when Theodore Payne collected plants. Your name's in the list of having made some collections and records. Um, but it's a great list of the plants that are native to this, and we so encourage you to seek out this information in plants, not just local to LA, but maybe local to your mountain range, yeah. which is really neat. Um, and this was a, a slide I put in the, the first time I did the Right Plant, Right Place Fire edition on October 20th. That morning, this was posted on our local YouTube page. So six weeks from the fire, without a rain yet, the laurel sumac had started resprouting already, which is really kind of exciting. And when we were up in uh, part of the burn area last week, Kitty and Andrew and I, and we saw laurel sumac, datura, you know, the jimson weed with in flower already going. Um, the, uh, what else was we sprouting? The ailanthus, the tree of heaven, with the invasive weed was sprouting up there. And what was this? A poison oak? Datura and, and the laurel sumac were sprouting big time already. That's it. We did it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, we have time for like five minutes of questions, and then we're going to talk to you now. Um, no, we're going to take a break. Um, five, like five minutes for questions and stretching. If you want to stand up a little bit, and why are you asking? Because we're just, thinking about lunch. Yeah, the well, lunch is at twelve thirty, so we have a half an hour to do okay, the plants. That's good. Yeah, but are there any questions before we do that? I just have a question about tree planting, though. Um, is that recommended after a fire? Or? Um, if you have a need for a tree, I, I, I guess it's more. Um, what, why, why do you ask? Do you think well, trees because are... we're planning on doing a tree planting at the experimental forest. Oh, oh. And... Oh, you're talking about planting out the wild, okay? Yeah. As opposed to planting the tree in your house. That's right. What so, how do we want to answer that? You know, I think a lot of stuff is done in the name of doing a good thing, but a lot of trees are put out there that were never there. It may not be the correct species. It may not be the genetic. But I mean, if it is the correct species. Well, what do you think? Well, you're talking about the experimental forest. Which wasn't always the correct species. Anyway. Right. I, I think it's really important if you're planting in wild spaces that you keep them native. I mean, they're just not enough really genetically pure stems. I mean, it's not really, my question isn't really about planting non-natives. The question is what, are pointers for restoring like a tree habitat. I, I was wondering if there were any. Well, I, 
Yeah, you can go ahead and plant them. Just be sure that you plant with big basins and that you're there to water them in case Mother Nature doesn't come through. But yeah, it's perfectly fine to go ahead and plant them. But yeah, you'll have to supplement. Natives, yeah. Uh-huh. John? Yeah, I would say part of it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to restore habitats, then I think the important thing is to be sure you know what the natural landscape looked like and try and restore that. For example, uh, in Southern California for at least the last 50, 60 years, the Forest Service has been very involved in planting culture pine. And they planted it in many places, culture pine never occurred. And so, and the reason they do it is for no other reason than culture pines are easy to grow. And there's always culture pine seedlings available. For example, after the station fire, there were groves of uh, big cone duck fir that were burned out, but they had no seedlings to plant of big cone duck fir, so they planted culture pine. And that probably wasn't appropriate simply because the culture pine in many of those areas didn't occur there naturally. And also, it acts as a competitor against mm -hmm. the big cone Douglas fir coming back. Uh, but there's a lot of things that go into these decisions, and a lot of it has to do with availability of stock. And culture pine has been planted in many, many areas uh, where it probably never grew originally. Um, it is a good example, though, I've suggested to people when you're concerned about how to deal with climate change. And some people argue, well, we need to assist the migration of species into different areas. And, and uh, there is one very good example of assisted migration, and that's culture pine. We've assisted its migration tremendously. You use the word migration, I use the word invasion. You know, I, I have to tell you that my point of view in life now, I'm a restoration ecologist for the National Park Service up at Sequoia, and oh my god, we spend so much time trying to yank out the non-natives and make room for what, you know, belongs in these wild spaces. So. You know, that's where I'm coming from. There are just not many wild spaces and we have to be cognizant of what kind of, what we're introducing. One, because they're not necessarily well adapted to the new site. You know, the culture 